The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Welcome, everyone. This is the Stoa. The, the Stoa is a place to dialogue around what matters most at the knife's edge of history. And um, we're going to try to uh, hone that knife's edge a little today. So here we are. Uh, this is a series, an offering called High Pitch Conversations in a New Key. And I just wanted to, uh, sh to give credit to a philosopher, philosopher called uh, Susan Langer. She wrote a book called uh, Philosophy in a New Key. So that really actually does, uh, one of the reasons why we have this, it resonates off of that. Um, you're going to uh, meet us all in this conversation. Um, myself, Bonnie, and Rhea, and Nora, and Sky and Miriam, and Eche. Very brief history. This is emerged from um, conversations I had starting a couple of years ago where people after doing a podcast would say, why aren't there not more women in this space? Who do you recommend? Um, and what would happen at that time is I would immediately, many women's names would come to my, uh, in my imagination, but I'm like, really? They're not gonna, they're not gonna do a rebel wisdom podcast. There was like a disconnect between the framing that the podcast offered and what these women could offer. So is there a disconnect between the constraints of the medium and the real juice and gem of the way I was talking uh, to, some, to some of these women. So we started looking at this um, uh, consciously, uh, starting with Eche and, and Sky and I, and um, um, yeah, and um, it took a while for us to um, allow more information to come in and show us what this might be. And then we had a little bit of email conversation amongst all of us. And what we decided together to seed this first conversation is a little bit of a dialogue around uh, conversation. What for us personally do we find missing from this ecology of podcasts that, um, that connect us? What kind of conversation are we starving to see reflected back to us, right? This is a very powerful, you know, when you grew up in the 60s and you saw TV and you saw like families acting a certain way you were ashamed because your family didn't act like that, didn't give you permission to be who you were. And something like that happens sometimes in the podcast space. You're like, well, I don't reason like that. I don't talk like that. And so there's a, there's a, a phenomenon uh, that is like, a, is like shame. Like, and so uh, part of what we're hoping to do is bring into the light this whole other vast resource of conversation and knowledge um, that we think people are starving for uh, in the public realm and that we can build capacity through that feedback loop. So um, yeah, what, how, would you, how would you describe what's missing in this space? What, what, what would you love to see, tune in and see um, conversation? Um, yeah, and then we can just talk about some of the ways we name this later, uh, if we want to do that. But um, yeah, what do you see is the conversation that has most airtime? Uh, what kind of conversations would do you think would be valuable to see reflected in the public space? Are you opening it up? Uh, no, this first is for our panel discussion. Okay. 
Um, thanks for asking. Um, I can jump in. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, everyone. So um, as you ask that question, the first thing that comes to my mind and my heart is what I would love to see more of and hope maybe we can bring is a movement from the theoretical to the embodied, to the practical, to the daily life. So while I love the cognitive explorations um, and sort of the intellectual gymnastics that can happen and the deeper depths and the widths and the breadths of sense making that can happen in that theoretical space. I think um, what feels very pressing to me both individually and as I look out and, and feel the world is how can we actually bring these insights that we have right into really into our daily bread, like how we show up with our kids, how we show up with our partners, um, how we spend our days. Uh, so that, that's sort of one little beginning impulse that was present. I, I just really want to second that, Miriam, and say that I, I, I find so often that, um, you know, Bonita, Bonita was talking about shame and that there's um, a very real experience of, of having this toggle of if either you're speaking in the cognitive theoretical space and so you're showing that you know your theory, okay? And that gives you some sort of expertise or credibility for being in the complexity realm. But um, the other thing is to be talking about how that embodied understanding of the theory is played out in daily life. And very often people don't recognize it when it's in daily life, because it's not labeled. It's not inside the jargon. You don't talk about your kids, you know, decoupling or, you know, having these sort of various complexity um, terminologies uh, applied to them. And yet my dad used to always say, it doesn't count till you have it in your elbows, right? And so for me, this, this is this has been a source of just so much um, misunderstanding of of times when I have tried to really show up in my most human self and getting dismissed for it. People not actually being able to perceive the theoretical work that I am I am bringing through that process. Without the labels, it doesn't get noticed. Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to jump in and add how I, uh, throughout the years that I've been studying this stuff, um, how I've been getting in the business of all the mentors and teachers I've been working with, just pushing them to reveal what time do you wake up <laughs> what's the first thing you do how do you deal with this how do you deal with that like just wanting to understand you know how if it's you know, produce a lot of writing how is it that at what time and you know for how long do you write it is that level of personal revealing that I would love to see more of uh, from all these people that I look after, you know. It's a, just a real quick one, because I'd like everyone obviously to speak. Um, but I, I just thought it was interesting, um, Itch, how you said how you look up to them. And then I was thinking, what is the lens that I hold as I'm regarding these people on podcasts? And I realized the lens I hold is actually how well do they embody this stuff? Mm -hmm. Like, I will take someone way more seriously if they are living and breathing what they're talking about. So I just thought I'd add that little note. Mm -hmm.
yeah, to pick up from there. Um, in our email exchange we had over the last weeks, I also put up the, que the question like, can we actually be it right here, right now together? Can we embody in the conversation? Uh, can we actually show how complexity sits in a good conversation and in a dialogue uh, and that I've been searching the web <laughs> to, to actually find it, but it hardly was, it hardly is there. And um, I go with your lens, Miriam, like, are they embodying it? Or is it theory or And it made me aware of how that the mental view on things or the intellectual is still at least in, in this kind of medium is, is still um, more valued or higher valued or um, as much as, as, as we think that things are more balanced, but around knowing, or I don't know how else to call it. There's a lot that we could and should and need to explore, I think. Yeah, that's me for now. I'll jump in, uh, Ria. I just noticed how calm I feel when you speak, <laughs> um, which is nice because what I was going to add is that um, I often feel like I have like a wild animal inside of me when I'm in these, when not this space checking it yeah it's still there the wild animal <laughs> and it's like you know we've, we've tamed conversation so much and there's some deeper um experience that i'm yearning for like when you said what are you hungry for what are you starving for i'm really hungry for experiences where i can um be a little bit wilder you know like a little um, more unpredictable and, and that maybe others would feel comfortable to be a little more unpredictable. Like Bonnie, you always talk about your job being to insert novelty into the conversation. And I love that because it just bring for me, it brings things to life. And, um, yeah, and there's some aspect for me too. And I don't know if this is personal, but I, I'm sure others, there are others for whom this will resonate the emotional experience, like my, my tuning fork, like the way I move through the world is very, for better or worse, <laughs> emotionally tuned. And so, um, yeah, sometimes I find that there's not really, and it could be me projecting this, but I, I do find that there's maybe not as much space for me to express emotions. Um, <clears throat> And part of that is that I'm afraid that if I express them, they will be misunderstood or, you know, they won't, there won't be space for them somehow. So it's me with my, you know, it's kind of like me fighting my own taming, the wild animal and the tame part. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so this is interesting already because <clears throat> You know, in these, there, part of this is this notion of 
forwarding this into the public realm. And there's only so many models. And of course, uh, there's a strange attractor. How do we perform? What is, what is the implicit rules? And the models, like this is stereotypical and it's just to frame the conversation. But in general, the models are like, women show up as uh, like performance, like the view. Like there's a lot of performance happening and there's a lot of emotional kind of things happening <clears throat> in those spaces. So you can have a lot of emotion. But then in these spaces, these new kind of series and podcasts in this in this ecology, and I think Nora, this is, you'll know this. It's like the price of admission to express an emotion is to show you're very, very cognitively complex. And mm -hmm. that's what doesn't bring people like Skylar and Eche in. That's the price of admission. If you can prove, yeah, I understand, yeah, I understand, yeah, I understand, yeah, I understand, I understand. But then I'm saying this is very simple. Then you're trustworthy. And that's the price of admission to express an emotion in these spaces. And it's not about only emotions, but it's also what I call that inner knowing, that intuition, the, mm -hmm. the sense you have of something. It's not even real emotion like sadness or happy or anger or frustration. But there's so much more formats, or I don't find the right word, of knowing that are also important and that we need to balance and that will actually, actually, we need that wholeness. I call it a wholeness of knowing for actually sensing and knowing what is the next step we can take. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like there's these scripts and um, there are different scripts for different sorts of zones. Um, you know, there's kind of a, a, this sort of script and a that sort of script and, and um, then there's how you're living your life and the way that you approach breakfast the way that you are in interaction with your family, the way that you're in interaction with your own body, your own transformations in this time, because that is what's happening, um, is, is requiring a completely different tonality and texture of, of exploration Okay, and so that exploration is going to have a different kind of expression. And, and so we don't, like, there's just not a space to have that kind of expression of, of um, the sense of careful, wordless, fumbling, um, Sometimes it's poetic, right? It's the difference between talking about whatever the, the, the complexity is and being within it. And that transmitting that sensibility of being within the, the complexity of, of all that we, you know, we, and there's everyone sort of in a lot of transformations right now. Uh, what what is it? What does it feel like? Where where is it? And if you also have kind of the the theoretical work in there, the way that that is able to be held is really different, right? So the 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 way that my irritation, say, with my fifteen year old stepson, comes into communication and conversation is coming through a lifetime of working with systems and complexity. And there's all of these things are there and they are, 
they're 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 informing and they're they're helping me to to find a way to deal with difficult moments that are not moments to turn to the blackboard and start talking about complexity. They're moments to be in life, but to be in the complexity and not screw up the relational processes. And that's what this is all about, is being in the deep, sometimes no worded, emotional, relational um, processes. And they have, they, they go out, right? You know, then you can, they, they go into more relationships and more relationships. And if we're talking complexity theory, we start talking about second and third order processes. But what we're really talking about is how my kid then goes to school and feels in his classroom for the rest of the day. And, and you know, tending to that, that multiple layered relational process is what we are doing, right? Those are the pathways that go to the future. I love that. Um, I just wanted to notice, maybe others are noticing it too, just a different pace that we're having, which I'm really enjoying. Um, there's, there's a couple things that feel alive. One is that this conversation feels like it has spaciousness. Um, I'm not feeling, sometimes I'm in these kind of conversations and it's like, there's actually something that would like to be spoken through me or someone else and you can hardly get a word in. So even the fact that when one of us has spoken, there's a little space feels like already part of that movement that we're talking about of embodying. Um, and the other thing I wanted to share was, as you were speaking, Nora, I could feel, and I'm curious how this lands for you, but I could feel how when we are bringing the, the muchness, the, the complexity into daily life, in my experience, there's actually a, there, there's a thread through that is actually very simple because it it would be quite impossible to bring all the different angles and perspectives and systems upon systems and the the whole thing can feel like a big carriage how are you ever going to fit that into how are you going to chat with your 15 year old but when you start embodying simply the the growing circles of care concern compassion the, the living into the great mystery and the breadth and width and depth that we can all, you know, fill. Um, when, when that starts happening in your actual being, then in, in my experience, there is a simplicity. I'm not bringing it all. I'm actually just showing up with a trust that it is there. And, uh, and in a way, a stepping into the unknown and not having to show up as the one who knows. Mm. But I think that maybe is also something that I would yearn for in these podcast spaces is that we don't all have to show up as experts. We can actually know what we know and share it, which is awesome, but also really be there present with the edges that we don't have a clue about or that we're just very curious about and inquisitive and looking to find out together. I would like to highlight what I just heard that's most important for me. Um, uh, you know, I have a five-year-old child and uh, most of my time is still uh, very much being a mother. Like 90, 95% of my time, it feels like. And, um, um, Miriam, you said something about the being of it, uh, the, the moment of, uh, of that practice when as mothers were um, trying to embody um, certain ways of being is actually simple. Uh, it is that simplicity that I would love to hear us and other people to, to start trying to express. Like, 
and I know Bonnie hates it, hates it when I say principles and guiding principles, but I have that kind of tendency to look for um, North stars, at least, if not, um, I, mean, I do not believe in set in principle, set in stone principles, but um, I feel like there are certain North stars that could guide us in settling into that simplicity of just being with the understanding that it is our being that is wiring the child in front of us. Mm -hmm. um, and that wiring is what is going to carry that, this new, newly forming human uh, for the rest of his life. So it, it matters greatly how he gets wired in the early years of his life. It's just so interesting because there's so much of the communication that just has to do with not diving into the cultural script that has been written for us. And uh, it, that is sometimes the hardest thing in the world to do, uh, whether it's to not say the thing or to respond in a way that's off, 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 off the teleprompter. And it's, I mean, the, the, the compelling urge to say the thing. Um, I remember this one time when my daughter was, I don't know, she was like 14, 15. I walked into her room and it was a complete mess, right? clothes all over the floor, my clothes, and um, and that she had borrowed. I walked in and it, it happened, here it comes. My God, how do you even think in here? This place is a disaster. I spend all this money on things for you and this is how you, you know, can you hear the script? Do you know the script? We know the script. And she looked at me and she was like, she looks a lot like me. She had this like red hair and she was fire. And she said, you can't tell me how to live my life, okay? And in that moment, on the teleprompter, there's a few options, right? And one of them is, young lady, don't talk to me like that. Another one sounds like, well, as long as you live under my roof, I sure do have the right to, right? Okay, we know these things. And somehow, like you were saying, Miriam, in that moment, I, what I saw was this, fire and I thought my god this is so beautiful this fire what damage it would be to break this fire I don't even want to say dampen it but to break the fire and I just looked at her and I was like you're right I don't have the right to tell you what to do and she just knew I was going to come back with one of those script lines she was ready she was ah! And then it wasn't there. And what happened in that moment was not only did we have a shifting of arrangement about what was important in life, which is fairly significant, um, but we also had a moment around what it feels like to get off the cultural scripts together. And, and she got to see me learning something and changing my path sensing something I didn't know I was going to sense, responding differently, and actually altering the course of the relational process. And, you know, that's, I think that's what we're talking about, is it's in those moments. And it's in your, those moments with your partners, too. Like, that, that thing of just, you know, when you're really looking at this incredible complexity of life. Like, seriously, what do you want someone to promise you? That's a whole different kind of question. How do you want to be, how do you want to be in relationship with someone given the complexity of it all? What is that? And that's a different kind of question. Yeah, I think this is an important shift because <clears throat> that's the disservice that a lot of these complexity, I mean, there's a time for the theory and there's a time to look at complex systems from a theoretical point of view. 
like hydrology and plasma movements and stuff like that. But there's a real question whether systems models are appropriate to human experience. It's a, probably an unexamined assumption. And the real disservice is that it takes people away from where they can actually enter this beautiful complexity. Because, because the, the entry point is every place in your life, because your life is complex, nature is complex. And so I'm gonna piggyback off this uh, story. There's a million stories, you know me, Nora, I know we have a million stories, but this one came up. So by default, I get it from my mom. You know, I really like to cook and I have a big kitchen and I really like it clean. You know, when you like to clean. And my partner of 30 years, um, he likes to use the computer on the kitchen table and he does his, you know, he uses, he loves to be in the kitchen. He doesn't like to work in an office. And he is like, he grew up Italian family, everything's done in the kitchen. And so his books and his magazines and his unpaid bills and his computers and his his keys and his they're all over the kit it's a, it's it's like so i watch this torture me right and i notice i just notice and i and i turn it from like i'm angry at him to like what's that in me right and i watch it over and over again. And then one Christmas, he got a chainsaw for Christmas. And he put the chainsaw on my dining room table. And I watched that work on me, right? That it was there for like five months. Now, the thing is, it's not like he sees it and he's like, I'm getting at her. He doesn't see it. It's just a chainsaw on a dining room table. And the truth is, all of these things that drive us crazy are just like that. They're just silly concrete things that are scripted in us in these pathological ways. So I watched that. I was teaching my course and I go in and tell the students every month, you know, I'm still watching that thing. And it resolved itself by itself, but it never fully resolved in me, right? Quiet. Now that sounds silly. It's, it's, Sorry about the dog, but I'll just leave it at that. Like these opportunities, yeah, this is where the opportunities are. Yeah, I'm just noticing in both your stories, the inner competence, you know, the, the inner awareness that Nora, you had in that moment that you were able to see what was happening in you and see your daughter. And I love how you described her. I could see her too, as you described her. Um, and Bonnie, you too. I mean, you're always a model for me of this kind of process of like, really, I watched how it was working on me, you know? Um, yeah. And I still, I mean, I, I, I spend a lot of time working on my inner competence. Um, as a mystic and tantric practitioner, like a lot of my practice is, is the inner awareness. And still when the rubber hits the road, when it comes to parenting, I mean, this could, this could potentially just be a conversation about <laughs> parenting um, or relationships or, or whatever else. Um, it's all right there, right? But it is for me, the parenting that really is the big, a uh, test of all my so-called spirituality. Um, and it's such a gift, it's such a gift. I have fortunately a very no-nonsense nine-year-old girl and she won't take it. She points out the inconsistencies all the time. And she, <laughs> because of the pandemic, I'm doing a lot of my work in front of her which is kind of amazing because I'm doing a lot of coaching and very deep one-on-one -on -one work with people. And, you know, I'm mostly wearing headphones so that, and, and she's not always around, but, um, but sometimes she's hearing me, you know, in a, in a conversation like this or coaching someone or talking someone through something. And then I turn around and yell at her for whatever it is. And she's just like, 
okay, uh, I don't know, maybe you need a coach. <laughs> um, and it's hard, but it's lovely. And it's, and I'm thinking, you know, it's like the children. And then I often find, you know, also the, the gift of friends I have who are at another life stage, you know, like maybe elderly. Um, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents, even into my forties. Um, they were Kentucky farmers and it was such a gift to go every once in a while, I'll leave New York city and spend 24 or 48 hours in their household and just, I mean, just land completely in their presence. And it, it was, that was a profound experience. I keep, they keep coming back into my consciousness as we talk about this too. I want to pick it up. Um, also to, to stand up against how others see you parenting. Yeah. Uh, one thing is in your own house or that I remember being in a family reunion, whatever it was. And my then son, probably six or seven, doing something nasty. I don't remember what, but I kind of hit him. I mean, not very hard, but that was the pattern, you know, like Nora was telling. And then, yeah, first of all, he wasn't used to that I would do that. So he immediately, he kicked me back. Yeah, which is a normal, healthy response. <laughs> so, and I, I stopped. And I didn't say anything. And I remember my mother-in-law kind of trying to force me to, to say something to him because that was not appropriate. But I was like, this is healthy. If you get kicked, you kick back kind of. And the, the point was more to stand up against her view of me being the mother with my then eldest. So, that and yeah there's so many examples of yeah can we yeah to, to actually choose to step out of that mold and again and again and again um and probably help each other to step out of the mold and and not give up i mean the, the the conditioning is so deep and so old and yeah that was my contribution for now um I'd like to bring in the future here. As I've been listening, I'm hearing how we are all working with patterning that comes from our past. And um, there was something you said, Nora, about it. You, we were talking about how can you bring that complexity into life? And then there's a simplicity and it can be hard, right? Because you're sort of going right on the edge. And you don't really have scripts that you can follow. So that, that was sort of the, the, the feeling there of future. Um, how can we, you know, one, one of the questions I hold a lot in my work with parents is how can we recreate culture in our families? How can we do it in our partnerships? And, and how do we do it? Partly for me, it's yes, becoming very aware of the scripts that come from the past and know how to navigate them and become much more competent with that navigation. The other piece is to, to use the yearning we have towards a future, to use our imagination that we have of a possible future, and even to use literally any, any way we can inhabit a possible future that feels more sane, that feels more whole, 
like can we actually inhabit that even if just for momentary states to then inform us back to the present moment um and i, I was chuckling as uh, sky you were talking about your daughter listening to you coaching in a way i hear the dynamic right there i mean i teach a course for years now called parenting as a spiritual practice so i had a five-year-old who would look at me once in a while put her put her hands on her hips and say mama that's not parenting as a spiritual practice and literally the only thing I could do in that moment was like yeah you're right you know and part of the context within which I was teaching and which we've been parenting her is it's a journey we just doesn't mean we have to be there to be able to embody the culture we are talking about so we can actually be very inspired we can speak about it we can coach others in it and we're making our way there we'll fall flat on our faces at times and so then we can actually model i think for our kids also saying sorry or i really didn't get that one right um which i also heard in in the weave of your sharings funny because it seems like there's um first of all I I just have to say that I completely agree with you and in in the discussion of you know what what kind of change what what is the future all of this for me that lies absolutely in the intergenerational relationships um and and what is so tricky is that in some frameworks of the way we are often in pods talking about the theoretical and cognitive aspects of complexity, this piece um, defies any kind of logic that could be um, theorized upon, that you, could, that you could map. There is the deep experience of identity and, and how that is, I mean, why do we do the things we do? We, you know, there's so many things that we do that don't make any sense, but we do them because, because why? And, and somewhere in there is for me, this, it's really relevant that we are talking about family and the way that family is at the core of systems change. And, and it's not even, I mean, some of the family members you may not be in communication with, you may, they may be dead and gone, you know, generations ago, but they're still moving through us. And um, the ways in which I might respond in a moment, how much of that is me? Um, and how much of that is actually something that, that came before? And, and sort of that, that attention, like, so that's what happened in that moment with my daughter was there was attention to what I saw in her fiery self was actually that if I laid that down in that moment, I was gonna set something. And that thing that was gonna get set was gonna actually be a pivot in what it was possible to communicate for I don't know how many years in the future. So it wasn't what was communicated that was communicated. It was what was possible to communicate that was communicated, if that makes any sense. So it wasn't, it wasn't that I just didn't say the thing. It's that between the two of us, we had a moment where we went somewhere else entirely. And that meant that from then on, that door was open. Right, and that is a shifting, a whole shifting of of you know of of the possible, and and that happens in in one second. If you, I had one second to see that. So, how many generations did it take to prepare for that one minute when I could be there, and how to share that? right? So that we don't have to wait several generations because it's, it's there. It's always there. It's just that sometimes you can't see it or the patterns run so deep. They just, they're driving you. It's so hard <laughs> to get off of them. Yeah. I'd like to <clears throat> break in here and ask each one of you who have children. I don't have children. Um, 
a simple reflective question. And I kind of want to start with Eche because I know this is kind of in your in your field of vision. If you could reflect on this question, when you look at your child, what what is the future you see in them? Maybe just we can end with your reflections on that. What is when you what is the future you see in your children? That wasn't doesn't come from your past. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> yeah, that that has been a North Star kind of orientation, I feel, since I've become a mom. Um, I've been obsessed with this question of how, how do we raise the new human, you know, because I witnessed this new consciousness come in come onto earth into his body. I've been um, facilitating that, helping him out in this process. Um, so it is constantly that I hold this question, how do I not bog him down uh, with the cultural, social, and the personal limitations that I carry uh, so that he can fulfill uh, so that he can fully potentiate uh, to exist, to function, and hopefully even flourish in a very troubling world that he's inheriting at the moment. Um, you know, from the world side that is inheriting, I have no idea what's coming. I just have a sense that it's not going to be easy at all. Uh, so then I take my job really seriously as to how do I, uh, at all planes of existence, at the concrete level, at the bodily, you know, nervous system level, um, at the emotional regulation and, and, you know, thinking process level, and at the spiritual level, um, how do I set a foundation that allows for um, a human who can flourish regardless of, of the environment? Uh, or he knows how to make the choices uh, that will uh, allow him uh, and, you know, and the environment that he's going to be, um, which is planet Earth, you know, um, and like how does he then also become a, a, an agent of um, movement in the right direction? Because we need to be doing a lot of that. Mm. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that for now. I can pick it up. Um, I have three sons and I have seven grandchildren. And I can see in the grandchildren who are between, between two and 11 at the moment. Um, and how they have almost all of their energy does go into exploration and learning and figuring things out and it's amazing to see just from let's say my generation to them at least for my family how less they are burdened by by the past like they're just there's so much freedom that they they don't have many of these scripts that were used, at least when I was young, kind of uh, imprinted like every day uh, for years on end. And they have way more freedom and way more parents like Eche and Sky and Miriam. And so 
I see there a lot more potential that can actually be developed and is developing from when they're just a couple of months old. And it's in the beginning, I was surprised and it was, I thought it was exceptional, but now that I have seven, <laughs> it seemed like, whoa. Yeah. So in that way, it's kind of also hopeful, at least for the kids who can grow up in that way. I'm not saying it's happening everywhere, but uh, that's what I see from my perspective. I have six kids in my life. Um, two are from my body and four are my from my husband's previous marriages. And um, I have been, I was raised by somebody who actually was aware of the interdependencies and systems and all this stuff that we're talking about. So I had a model. Um, I had a, I had, the, um, I didn't know what that was, but you don't have to know because what happens with parenting, what happens across generations is not explicit. It's, it's in the, it's in indirect communication that this, that this really gets transmitted. Um, and my kids, I was careful and I paid attention and I was on it and I knew they're coming into a world that's changing. And I did all sorts of things. I could tell you hours of stories about them. Um, but, but I can tell you one thing that I didn't do, which was that in all of my workings with them, um, in all kinds of ways, uh, I didn't really take into account not only their ability to be in the world that was changing, but that they were going to be in really close relationships with other people who didn't know how to do that. Okay, this was a piece that I missed. And, um, and it was, it was, you know, I, of course, I was always, you know, modeling that, that thing of being in relationship and having communication. But what happens when you're in relationship with people who have no idea how to have those kinds of communication. And, and so um, they have been through the dark night. I mean, the generation of the 20 somethings and they were in, in university in the US and they had partners that were dealing with addiction, um, suicide, you know, we have been through it. And in those moments, you better be able to be there. And, and so for me, this is the real crunch, right? Like it's, it's in those moments when you really need to be able to perceive without a lot of wishy-washy jargon what it is to be in the interdependency of life. It's gotta be on board. It's not a, it's not a practice that's out here somewhere. It's, it's, it's here. Um, we were speaking earlier about this notion about being an expert. And this is something that I have pushed hard on with my, with my, in my whole life, because I was that little kid too. This idea that only adults of a certain kind of educational level can comprehend complexity. I'm calling full tilt bullshit on that. Full tilt. Um, my kids all got it. All the people that I work with around the world that have, you know, no education whatsoever, they get it. And part of it has to do with this thing of going through the dark night of meeting real difficulty in life and recognizing that it isn't single cause, that the causation is multiple, that there are all sorts of processes that are all around it. And that's it. I mean, that's the stuff right there. So this to me seems like the thing. And we're looking at the next generation and what do we see? They're going to be going along a road that's going to ask them to actually um, be in a kind of grace with extreme difficulties 
uh, it, it already is. And there are multiple layers and they're coming more than one at a time. And so that, I mean, ultimately it requires a lot of love and a sense of humor and a, 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 you know, a keen intellect and a lot of compassion and empathy and art. So that's, that's kind of what I'm working with. I'd like to jump in because um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Nora offered a beautiful weekly call for parents about schooling last spring when none of us knew what we were doing. And I've learned so much from her in this regard. And that was, that was beautiful. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the one thing I'll add and um, is that, and I don't know if this is good advice or bad advice, but we have a, a saying, my daughter and I, that there are rules, there are capital R rules and there are small R rules. And she's been brought up mostly in Brooklyn in New York City. And I'm often pointing out to her, like she has a very different relationship to authority, I guess is where I'm kind of going with this. Um, in part because she's watching the political shenanigans as a nine-year-old, it's incredible. Like she sees right through. Um, and, and we talk a lot in the city about, and with school, she goes to a public school. Um, and there've been times when I've really, that's really been hard for me. And then there've been times when it's been an incredible opportunity to teach her a lot about which rules she needs to follow and which rules we don't necessarily need to follow. And I model that a lot. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's it. I just, you know, her relationship to authority is very, very, very different. And her inner authority is really what I'm trying to nurture in her because I foresee also that it's gonna be an incredibly, um, I don't even know what the word is, challenging probably doesn't capture it, but at the, at the end of the day, I want her to be, because she came in this way anyway, like very strongly in her center and very perceptive and I like a little no nonsense. And I see that in a lot of children, actually. They're very aware of the climate situation. We haven't really mentioned that overtly, but they feel it. They already have a sense um, for what they're gonna be dealing with. She's been to so many marches. She has a favorite march. Um, so, you know, she's like really engaged and, and really navigating by her own inner authority. Um, and that's what I try to nurture. I, do we still have time? Yeah. So um, just first, I love your question. I've, I've been bathing in it since you asked it, Bonita. Um, and I've been kind of looking in my daughter's eyes. She's 17 now and just with that question, not actually, she's at school right now, but like in, in my imagination, I've been looking in her eyes and just looking at the future that I see in there. Um, so there's a few things, because she's 17, wow, Nora, when you spoke it, it like it was such a, my whole body was just feeling the, for me, the, uh, I find it intense to be parenting now and knowing that the future is this unknown. I, it breaks, it literally breaks my heart um, in a very visceral way. And, and we have, since she was born, been working so hard to recreate culture in our family and in our greater family and community and environment. Um, but God, it is, it's slow, you know, it's, it's slow. So, there's a lot of heartache there. Um, there's, there's actually, I have fear too. Um, but when I look into her eyes and look at the future that she is starting to embody, there, there's some things there. One is her capacity for discernment blows me away. So, and I've heard that now, um, you know, this sort of the clarity, the seeing through the bullshit. Um, and Nora, I was really moved by hearing your experience of having older kids now and how they're not met in the way that they were met. And this has started for my daughter ever since she homeschooled um, with us uh, until she was 14. But as soon as she went over to um, public school, she started experiencing that a lot, that she was not being met the way she was met at home and with her peers in the homeschooling community. 
um, and, and what, what that is like to navigate and how early grief can set in around that. I mean, the kind of grief that I meet in myself on a daily basis, she was meeting at age, you know, 14, 15. Um, but there's something also that I see in her that I, I am, gives me a lot of hope and it's a future where her sensitivity as in her, we raised her so that I feel like she really didn't have to shut down much, like her, her open pores were able to stay very open. And at the same time we've attempted, and you know, it's an ongoing experiment, like she's still growing up, but we've attempted to build a, uh, within her, with her a sturdiness from the, from the inside. So rather than shut down or protect the sensitivity actually to match that with an inner sturdiness. And I've seen a resilience in her that also has uh, given me a lot of hope when I look at the future in her eyes, because I, I can see her already having had um, some, you know, some, some smaller, but some, some small dark nights of her soul and how she has already been able within a one, two year time frame, being able to take in the insights, learn the lessons and, and literally embody the theory. Like she got it and now she is acting differently in relationships. So the, the quick turnaround, um, that also gives, gives me certainly a lot of hope when I consider the future, but I don't want to end on this in difficult note maybe, but, but it's real. And it's that I feel in the teenage years right now in the teens that I'm aware of um, that I'm meeting through her, there is a not taking for granted that there is a future. And it's, it, 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 I think it's huge. It's a great grief that is running through them that they maybe have words for and maybe not. But that is very different, I think, than what I remember when I was growing up. I knew there were big threats, but I, I felt assured of a future. And so, um, yeah, I just wanna maybe add in the context, which I know we all hold so closely to ourselves, but how much it, really this is not just an exercise that we need to bring theory into embodiment this is like fucking sorry maybe you should use that word this really really matters okay and I know I'm talking to everyone who knows this but I'm just gonna say it so the universe hears it more it really really matters that we actually start living in our cells in our bones in our minds our hearts our spirits our souls like we we bring this to life, that that we feel uh, the future is calling for, because that might actually make a future possible. Well, so I would like to take up this topic on another high pitch session. I think this is this is really uh, this is. I don't even know what to say. This is really what's what's very important and very unsolved it's not it's not being taken up and it's not solved and i think the people that are here uh, are the people that are working on it i mean no no for sure miriam this is basically your life's work Eche is part of it now um and for me it's very uh interesting because and i'll just kind of wrap up with this non-personal but more of a conceptual thread the einstein predicted this he said the rate of change the rate of the change in knowledge would be so accelerated that from the perspective of the children the parents would live in the past and then he said so then what is the role of adults and educators you're going to be faced with teaching your child an unknown and unknowable future and for me as an educator one of the things that i teach one of the principles i take from this is that if you look at education today, we're constantly trying to teach children the lessons that we learned. And this is completely irrelevant to them. So we're, first we have to put the problem in them and then show them how to solve it. And the problems they face, we haven't learned, only they can learn to solve them. So this transforms the relationship between the adult and the child and the teacher and the student. And that's something I, I, I would really like to um, have one of these conversations around with you.
Now, I know we didn't get uh, time for question and answers. Um, this panel is, a, is, you know, it's a pretty big panel. And I think the design is we wanted to show many uh, different voices from within this panel. One of the things that it's quite often a complaint that there's not breakout groups in time for participation. But what I want you to encourage you is to create your own groups and continue the conversation in your own groups. And hopefully this is a, uh, this is a service that we can do is to catalyze continuing conversations off of these, of, of these conversations. So I wanna thank Peter for uh, making the space possible and encouraging me and oh man, I just so appreciative of the women on this panel. Um, Peter? Um, you want me to close? Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yeah, I just, and I don't mean this in a sexual way, but just listening, I was very turned on uh, or maybe switched on is a better phrase. And I just, I just felt like my body vibrating throughout that whole session. Um, and I don't think the Q and A was missed. Uh, so thought that was beautiful. So thank you, Benita and everyone for, for coming today. Uh, we have another session penciled in, not next week, but the week after. So uh, we'll circle back on email, see if that's a go, and then uh, we'll post on the website. Uh, next event, we have one in an hour or 2 p.m. Eastern time with Greg Henriquez and uh, Zach Stein is gonna guest appear in that one. So if you wanna check that out, you can RSP on the website. That being said, I, that's all I have to say. Um, so thanks so much for coming to STOA. Let's listen to some good music that Benita chose. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Benita. Thanks, Peter. Bye-bye. Thanks, 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 everyone. For having